Well, good morning, everyone. We will be in Matthew chapter 7, so please turn there and pray with me. Father, again, we come before you, and I'm grateful for the faith of your people. Grateful for the stories of your redemptive and powerful work. Grateful for answers to prayer. I'm grateful for the prayers of people and the songs of your people this morning. There's sometimes, I think, Lord, where you allow us to borrow the faith of others to strengthen us, and I pray that you'd be doing that this morning. I think you are. So as we come to your word and as we consider kind of a tough passage to really get our minds and hearts around, Lord, we pray that we would come to see you as our good and generous Father once again. We pray this in your name. Amen. It was interesting. I had previewed that video of the DeWitts and had forgotten exactly what they said and I was writing this sermon and thinking about some stuff and then they said something. I was like, huh, that actually connects with, my, with the sermon. And what, what we heard from them is that one of the things that, that Marie said is prayer works. Prayer works. In James chapter 5, James says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective as it's working. And, and I agree with that. And it's, like I said in my prayer, it's, it's amazing and wonderful to see that and be encouraged by how God, I mean, if you were following along, I'm not on Facebook, but I got updates about Marie and Rob, and as you were following along, it was pretty amazing to see what God did. But brothers and sisters, what about those times when prayer doesn't seem to work? I was at a funeral for a 17-year-old boy yesterday, and um, it was hard because prayer didn't turn out the way that his family and we thought it would. What about the times when prayer doesn't seem to work? And I think that as Christians sometimes, if we're honest, we come across these words of Jesus where he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And I think sometimes as Christians we get a little bit embarrassed. Because it seems like I know a lot of people who ask and they didn't get what they asked for. I know a lot of people who sought and didn't find. There's millions of refugees, brand new, fresh Ukrainian refugees pouring into the rest of Europe right now, probably calling out to God in some way, shape, or form. Are these words that promise us too much because in the face of struggles and trials and suffering and war and tragedy, is it really true that God gives us everything we ask for? Does God really give us all that we seek? And does he always open every door that we knock on? Thanks for being the downer, Pastor. <laughs> uh, Carrie and I just finished watching a show um, on Amazon, and we got to the end of it. The last episode, it was a rough show to watch, just real life in the 1900s or the 19th century. And, uh, one of the characters said something about prayer, and another character said, you don't pray. And this character responded with, I pray, it just doesn't work. So what happens when prayer doesn't work, when we don't get the desired results, when tragedy or death or, or loss or heartache or war seem to be the only result that we get at the end of our, of our tear-filled, heart-aching season on our knees in prayer? And I think we are simply at the base of it. I think we're core. I, I'm this way. At, our, at my core, I'm somebody who wants things to work. And, and when prayer doesn't seem to work, sometimes I just don't know what to do. But perhaps what Jesus is actually saying here is that prayer isn't necessarily about getting it to work. Prayer is something that's much deeper than that. I think what Jesus is trying to get at here is that at the character of prayer, which as we'll see in a few minutes, is actually based on the character of our God, who is a generous and good Father. So how does Jesus then characterize what prayer 
is? Well, he characterizes it with three verbs, three commands, really. Ask, seek, knock. What is prayer? Prayer is asking. Prayer is seeking. Prayer is knocking. And it's important to understand this from our perspective, anyway, that prayer is basically a request. It could, you could sum it up with this word, God, please. If you've paid any attention to the Sermon on the Mount up to this point, you've, you've probably considered some of Jesus' own requirements for what life in the kingdom is like. And if you've done that, then you're not surprised that when we get to this point, when we're almost to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and, and you've considered all the things that Jesus has put before us, that he's now stopping and saying, you know what, you need to ask. You need to go to your father and ask. You need to go to him and, and ask for help. Because if you're to live this life that I've called you as my people to live, you are absolutely going to need the help of your father. You see, he, he puts these radical requirements on us that seem virtually impossible. So look back at the previous chapter, Matthew chapter 6, verse, excuse me, verse, chapter 5, verse 20, two chapters ahead where he says this, I tell you, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So think of the best person you know, the one who just does everything right, the one who is good, the one who's kind, the one who's nice, the one who's loving, the one who's forgiving, the one who, who, who tends to keep the rules and hold high standards. Think of them and then kick that ante up a notch. And, and Jesus is saying, be better than that. Okay, the best people that you can think of, be better than them. So don't just refrain from committing adultery. Don't just not commit adultery. In fact, keep yourself from even looking at a man or a woman with, with lustful intent. Don't just refrain from murder, but don't even be angry with your brother or sister. So Jesus takes us on this tour of, of our heart, really. And, and a few chapters down the line in the sermon, he, he says, and it shouldn't be natural for us to, it should be natural for us to ask Jesus, are you serious when you expect us, in chapter 5, verse 48, to be perfect of, as our heavenly Father is perfect? Even last week, we talked about judging, and Jesus in chapter 7, verse 1 says, don't judge unfairly, lest others judge you in the same way. And which one of us hasn't walked into a room with other people in it and in the first five minutes made some sort of judgment? So it's no wonder on the heels of, of realizing all of our constant need. In that picture last, last week of the person with the two by four stuck in their eye. It's no wonder that Jesus commands us to ask for help. To ask, to seek to knock, because it's only when we realize our desperate need that prayer begins to take on the character that it's meant to have. Because if we thought we could do this on our own, if we thought we, 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 we could do what God asks us to do in our own power, then we wouldn't see the need to ask. If we thought we already had everything that we need, we wouldn't be seeking. And if we were confident that we were already firmly on the inside, then we wouldn't have to be knocking on any doors. You see, what true prayer is, is the heartfelt request of a child to his or her father, a request that's born out of need and planted in the fertile soil of relationship. Prayer is a heartfelt request of a child to their father, born out of need and planted in the fertile so soil of relationship. So Jesus gives us these three words, and I want to walk through them one by one. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. And when Jesus commands us to ask, I think we have to take into context the entire sermon, really because what Jesus are you, are you telling us to ask for? And, and if we, we think about the whole sermon, I, I think, and I, I can see three fundamental ways that we ask and we have an issue with actually how we ask God for things. And I think the first is we have a problem when we worry. 
When we ask out of anxiety or worry, which is why God gave us this beautiful teaching at the end of chapter 6 that, that Tom taught on a couple of weeks ago, where Jesus says, do not be anxious about tomorrow, because the good news is that our basic needs, what we shall eat, what we shall drink, what we shall wear, are in God's mind as our good provider, as, as the ultimate giver. Those things are in his mind. And Matthew 6, 8 says, For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Chapter, uh, verse, verse 32 of the same chapter, Your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. And because these things are in God's mind, they don't have to be in our mind. Do you know how much time... I spend thinking about how much food is in our refrigerator or how much toilet paper we have on the shelf in the utility room or in the cupboard. None. I don't even think about it. It doesn't cross my mind because I know that that woman right there spends hours and hours thinking about it. It's in her mind. And it, I'll tell you, it's incredibly freeing because she thinks about these things I don't have to. And I'm freed up to do other things, like get money in the checking account. And that's the same reality with God that He's thinking about these things that we fundamentally need. They're in His mind. Why in the world do we need to worry about them? And when we come and we ask God with all this worry about these things, he's telling us you don't need to worry about those things. There's another, another fundamental problem we come when we ask God for things, and it's when we desire more. When we desire more. James chapter 4, here's what James says. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And what James is getting at here is basically, when you come to God, you ask for things that, to spend on your passions because you want them for your own selfish motives. And Jesus does direct us to ask for basic things. Give us this day our daily bread, Jesus says. We should ask God for these basic things. And beyond that, we should live in a simple trust with what he gives us. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. Because we are children of a father who owns everything. We have no need to lay up treasures for ourselves on earth. So sometimes we just ask for more than we need. And I think thirdly, our problem is that we ask for the wrong things. So look at verse 9 and 10 of chapter 7. Or which one of you, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? And I, and I think Jesus doesn't say it explicitly, but I think hidden in here, kind of tongue-in-cheek, one of the things that Jesus is asking is that oftentimes in our brokenness, in, our, in being overcome by our desires, we come to God and we ask for the wrong things. And we say, God, would you please give me a rock? I'm hungry. And God says, no, that wouldn't do you any good, but I'll give you some bread. No, oh, that's gross. I don't want any bread. Can I please have a cobra? Or a rattlesnake. No, that would probably kill you. But I'll give you a fish to nourish you and give you the sustenance that, we, that you need. And so often we come to God and we ask these things that are actually going to do us harm, these things that are going to be bad for us. We ask for rocks and serpents. And he says, no, 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 I'm going to give you bread and fish. And then we complain because we didn't get what we wanted but he gave us what was good for us. And the heart and prayer of the, the heart and soul, the purpose of the Lord's Prayer in chapter six, verses nine to 13, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The heart and soul of this prayer is Jesus giving us a basic outline of the things that he wants us to ask for. And they're all things that reflect the heart of our Father. Ask for the things that the Father desires you to ask for. And he he wants us to ask in a simple way that our own heart, I believe, that our own heart would reflect our Father's heart when we come to him and ask that we might receive. So the first word is ask. The second is seek. Seek that you will find. And, And this verb commands us to look for something. To, to go on a quest, if you will, to, to find something. And there's a, there's a sense where this word contains in it that we're not just looking for something, but we're looking for something to have it as our own. So, so there is a desire here to gain something that we don't currently possess. Or to find something that is, that is maybe lost or has gone missing. That's the, the end of seeking, is finding. And which one of us isn't seeking certain things in our life. What are you seeking? Jesus is clear throughout the sermon that there should be things that we shouldn't seek, like treasures on earth. He says, for the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But what should we seek? What does Jesus say in the very next verse? What should we seek? Seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. And this search for God, this is is actually echoed throughout the Old Testament's uh, prophets, like Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. In Jeremiah chapter 29, where God says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. So what, is, what does Jesus want us to seek when he commands us to seek that we might find? God himself. God's kingdom. God's righteousness that is what we are to be seeking and when we seek that jesus promises we will find it and then finally knock this is the third and final verb in jesus's command about prayer to knock it's um, an implication of the verse is very simple you knock on a door as a request to be let in You want to be on the inside even though you're on the outside. How many of you have ever felt like an outsider in any area of your life? And yet we all have this deep longing. We have a deep, innate desire to be part of something, to be welcomed in, to be on the inside, to be in the know, to come in from the elements, to escape the cold and the danger, to end the loneliness and the isolation of being out there, to be greeted with a warm fireplace and a comfortable chair and a a seat at the table to a freshly cooked meal. Who doesn't love that picture? Jesus is saying, knock. Come in from the cold. Come inside and be part of the Father's household. And when you knock on the door of my kingdom, you will be welcomed in with open arms. Not because you have some kind of perfect pedigree or family background. Not because you have the right position in society. Not because you have power or money or looks. Not because you've worked or weaseled your way in. You will be welcomed because Jesus' Father is the one who longs for all of his prodigal children to come home. And I love in the book of Revelation, at the very beginning of the of kind of the prophetic piece of, of Revelation, of all these visions, it starts with these words. This is the first thing that John writes there in Revelation 4.1. He says, After this I looked, and behold, 
a door standing open in heaven. Now, you can, you can interpret anything in Revelation 100 ways to Sunday. But what I see when I, when I hear that, it could be, yeah, there's a door now to this revelation that John's about to receive. But, but what I say is the character of God. Saying, in heaven there's a door and the door is open. Will you come in? Will you come in and be part of this king's kingdom? So the command to knock along with this promise that Jesus gives us here of an open door doesn't guarantee, though, that we will always knock on the right door or that we'll even bother to knock. There are many doors we can try. Some of these doors lead to excitement. Some of them lead to pleasure. Some of them lead to money. Some of them lead to horrible things. But there is one door that might be very difficult to find for those who seek it. But when it is found and when it is knocked on, it will be open to all humble and honest travelers. Jesus actually speaks of this a few verses later in chapter 7, verse 13. Enter, he says, by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. But for all who knock at that gate, to them, Jesus says, it will be opened. Come in. Be part of the family. Ask, seek, knock. And that the character is, is a character of request. That's the character of prayer. Ask for the Father's heart in the things that He Himself desires. Seek the kingdom and seek the Father Himself. Knock on His door and you will be granted access into His home, into His family. This is all based and it all reminds us. This prayer reminds us that, that prayer does not happen in a vacuum. We're not just throwing up empty words to some random God for the things that we might need. We're not submitting our prayer, prayer request to, to, a, to a kind of a brainless spam bot who's just going to spew out answers to us. We're not submitting our prayer request to, to no one and a faceless nothing. We're asking our Heavenly Father. If Jesus wants us to know anything about God in this sermon, this is it. He longs for us to know that God is our Father. He, he, he speaks of this 16 times in three chapters. Can I point them out to you? Take a pencil or a pen. Write in your Bible. <gasps> if you don't want to do that, grab one of the pew Bibles and write it in. Circle these, I'm serious, circle them, and every time you read this sermon, you will see 16 times where Jesus refers to your Father. Chapter 5, verse 16, your Father. Chapter 5, verse 45, your Father. Chapter 5, verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Chapter 6, verse 1, your Father Chapter 6, verse 4, your father. Chapter 6, verse 6, your father. Twice, your father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 8 of the same chapter, do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Verse 9, pray then like this, our father in heaven. Verse 14, your heavenly father will forgive you. Verse 15, your heavenly father, your father. Keep going. Verse 18, twice, your father, your father. Verse 26, your heavenly Father. Verse 32, your heavenly Father. Verse chapter 7, verse 11, right here, your Father. 16. You know what happens when somebody repeats something in Scripture? Pay attention. Jesus wants you to know that you have a heavenly Father and you are His sons and daughters and He loves you. And he wants you to come and ask, seek, and knock because he is a good father who wants you to come and ask for what you need. God's goodness is full of wisdom. 
He's fully aware of all of our needs. We don't surprise him when we come to him and ask him for something. Our requests are fully known to him, but he's not keen on giving anything to us until we ask. Chapter 5, verse 8, For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So pray then like this, Our Father in heaven. He knows, yet he wants us to ask. Even the fact that Jesus commands us here to ask and seek and knock implies that God is not hesitant or reluctant, but he desires for us to approach him with our requests. I mean, what parent doesn't look at their child and feel and think and say, if you need anything, absolutely anything, especially you're sending your kids off into the world. If you need anything, absolutely anything, just ask. Don't hesitate to ask. I mean it, anything. Good parents who love their children are generally ready and willing to listen and to grant their children's requests, especially when their requests align so closely with our own desires for them. I said at the beginning that Perhaps prayer isn't something that we should expect to just work in the way that we think it should. Brothers and sisters, I I think prayer works, but I don't think we primarily pray because it works. I think Jesus wants us to pray because it's the only way for us to survive in the kingdom. In the movie Shadowlands, which was a movie about C.S. Lewis, came out, I think, in the 90s, which now is a long time ago. Um, It was uh, starring Anthony Hopkins as C.S. Lewis, and there's this one interchange in the in the in the movie where his he's married and his wife is dying, and this his friend says to him, "I know how hard you've been praying, and now God is answering your prayers." And his response is this: "That's not why I pray, Harry." I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. Prayer doesn't change God. It changes me. And I I just love that insight. I pray because I need that. I'm helpless, and that just flows out of me. It doesn't change God. It changes me. See, God knows what we need before we ask him, which means that he really doesn't need us to ask. He doesn't need us to seek. He doesn't need us to knock, but he knows that what is best for you and what is best for me is that we each come to a place where we want what we need. We have to get to the place where we actually want what we need to ask for, which is God himself. And he wants his children to come and desire to be with him, to treasure him, to seek for more of him. And when we receive what we asked for, then we treasure it all the more. He knows that if we truly find what we're looking for, what our hearts are deeply looking for, then we must be people who are seeking. He knows that until we long to get on the inside, that we'll never knock at the door that will never have the door opened to us. See, God is a good father, and God is generous. Verse 11, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who seek him? God is the ultimate giver. And the only kinds of gifts that he gives are good ones. Again, back to James 1. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The king that we serve, our father, is a generous king, a generous father, and the kingdom is a kingdom of generosity that's filled with forgiveness rather than judgment. It's filled with grace rather than condemnation. It's filled with relationships rather than transactions, and it's filled with abundance rather than scarcity. That's what God gives us because he is a good and generous father. 
So today we come to the table, come to the communion meal, to the feast. We've knocked on the door and here God gives us a feast, the feast of a good and generous father who loves to share his bounty. He loves to share his gifts with his sons and daughters and there's no better gift that God can give us than himself. And this small meal today is a is a picture, a snapshot of that generosity from a God who so loved the world that he gave his only son that we who believe in him might have eternal life. And in this meal, we partake of that gift. We remember by taking a little piece, a little morsel of bread, we're reminded of his broken body. And in faith, as we take that and we accept that sacrifice that pays for our sins. We take of the fruit of the vine and we're reminded of his blood that's poured out to create a new covenant with us, an eternal covenant, a family bond, an open door to the kingdom for all who ask, for all who seek, for all who knock, for all who would come as sons and daughters. So would you, brothers and sisters, come, partake, and place your faith maybe again Maybe for the first time in the the crucified and risen Christ, our Savior. You pray with me. Father, sometimes we don't know what to ask for and how to ask. And sometimes, quite honestly, we shake our fists because we've not received what we've asked for. Even as Eric prayed before, we live in a broken world full of selfishness and sin and human desires and oppression and bullies. And the difficult thing to confess this morning is that all of that is right here in my own heart, in each of our hearts. So Father, this morning we come and confess that we have nothing without you, that we are nothing without you, that we're in desperate need, that we are helpless and need your help. God, our neediness just flows out of us like breathing. And so we come to you as needy people, needy children, and we ask. We ask for your mind, we ask for your favor, we ask for your grace. We ask for the humility to to be changed and transformed by you. We come seeking. Sometimes we don't know what we're seeking, and yet in our heart of hearts, we're seeking to be fulfilled. We're seeking to know that we're loved. We're seeking relationship. And today, Lord, we come and we seek you, perhaps for the first time. And if there are those here Lord, who you're drawing to come and seek, to come and knock, would you draw them this morning? As they knock, would you open the door? Lord, each of us in our own way are knocking again at the door, wanting to be let in, wanting to know that we're your children. Would you remind us this morning that we are? We're grateful for our big brother Jesus and all he's done for us. We pray these things in his name, amen.